And today is the first day, of course, of Vacation Bible School. We're excited about that. Now, because it's the first day of Bible school, I thought I'd give us a break from the drama and difficulty of the book of Revelation. Although some would say VBS also has the same characteristics. I don't know. Depends on what goes on in your classroom. It's always chaotic. It's always crazy. But it's always a lot of fun at the same time. And we love to see all the children and the students come in. We're excited about that. Because it is a special time. It's a great time. It's an opportunity for all of us involved to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I submit to you that when we do things like have vacation Bible school and anything that reaches out to our community, that is when the church is being the church. Because we are to take the mission that Jesus Christ had and has given us, and that is to seek and to save that which is lost. And so I'm excited about Vacation Bible School today. I'm excited about it this week. I know we got a lot of folks, all this work that has been done, they're all worn out, but they still have a week of Bible school to go. So oftentimes we forget that. Listen, pray for these folks and pray for these teachers and these, these people who are going to be out in the field playing games and, and the folks back in the, in the crafts and the snacks and all that stuff. Because we are gathered to do an exciting, eternal, and profound thing. And that is to bring the gospel to hearts and minds. Let me ask a question. We ask it periodically, but I always like to know, how many people here were saved before they were 18 years old? Raise your hand. Save and hold it up for a second. Save. Look at that. Save before you were 18 years old. I got saved when I was 15. Many people get saved at vacation Bible school. And they're able to pass from death unto life. So if you're working in Bible school today, you are truly doing commissioned eternal ministry. You know, especially those of you who are teaching and sharing the gospel. And oftentimes when we get ready for Bible school, we pull together the decorations and all the crafts and the snacks and the literature, the things that we want to teach these kids as they come in. And oftentimes we stress, and well, we should, over what we're going to teach them and what they are going to learn. But I think sometimes we get so caught up in the machinations and the putting it together that maybe we need to be reminded what we can learn from the children. Yes, we're going to teach the children. Yes, we're going to share with the children and the students. But here's the thing. What can we learn from them? Many people often say, well, why do we go to so much trouble to have Bible school? And why do we have children's ministry? They didn't have children's ministry when I was growing up. Why don't we do all of these things? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because we are to seek and to save that which is lost. And as one well-known Bible teacher likes to say, we should do everything short of sin to bring people to Christ. And we need to start with children. Because as we saw the last couple of weeks, there is a living devil and a demonic host, and they want to destroy your children and grandchildren. They want to attack families. And we are now going to take the front line this week, and we are going to proclaim God's truth. But while we're teaching the children, I want to focus on what can we learn from the children this week. And tonight, of course, the first night. And the first night is always chaos, isn't it? Even though things have been worked out and we got people plugged in, we got, we got strategies and so forth, sometimes it can still get a little, little crazy. And we have everybody finding their way and doing their thing. Story is told of a, of a mother's little darling going to Bible school. And mother's little darling comes home from his first day of BBS. And she says, oh, the mother says, I hope you didn't cry. His mother says reassuringly, and he looked up at her and says, I didn't, <laughs> but boy, the teacher sure did. Woohoo! All right. <laughs> Bible school is not for the faint of heart because you never know who's coming in and what they're bringing with them. And it's exciting. But listen, teachers, listen, VBS workers, listen, West Concord observers, 
you need not only to teach the children, but let's ask ourselves, what can we learn from the children? Take your Bibles and join me in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to see a, a scenario where Jesus is going to do an object lesson. We used to do pastor's pals here at West Concord, and people thought, oh, that was a neat thing. David Brown, one of our interim pastors before me, started it, and I carried on the tradition for quite some time. And basically what it involved was just about three or four minutes of telling a brief object lesson to communicate a, a deep and eternal truth. Well, listen, David Brown didn't originate that. I didn't originate that. Jesus himself used illustrations. He used objects. He used people to teach object lessons. Sometimes in the Bible, these lessons are called parables. And that's a Greek iteration. It literally means to cast alongside of para, alongside bale, and the Greek is ball or to cast. And Jesus oftentimes taught great and deep truth using illustrations and objects and yes, even people. And as we get into the scriptures this morning, we're going to see that he is going to use children to teach his disciples and his followers a lesson concerning humility. Now, oftentimes people think that children should be seen and not heard. Why, we don't need to fool with children. Boy, don't let those children run through the church. Don't let those children stand on that. Don't let the children touch that. Don't let the children hurt that. I want to tell you something. As pastor of West Concord Baptist Church, nothing thrills my heart more than seeing little kids run all over this place. Nothing thrills my heart more to watch children interact and enjoy this place and the folks here. I love the kids. Now, when Jesus at one point was talking and preaching, children came up and the disciples actually said, the disciples of Jesus, who became later apostles, they actually said, get out of here, kids. He's busy. That's Mike Farley's paraphrase. But that's basically what it was. He's busy. And Jesus said, no, no, you bring them on. Allow them to come. And the old King James, it's suffer to let the little children come unto me. And I hear VBS going, that's it. Suffer. No, no. He says, allow them to come. Permit them to come. Jesus loved children. That's not just a simple song that we grew up singing. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And he's broken for them. But not only does he love them and want to save them, but we at the same time can watch them and learn from them. And that's exactly what he's going to teach. And he's going to teach us a lesson from the children about humility. And I think that that is a... A, a characteristic that is, that is going away in our culture. Because of social media, we're constantly putting ourselves out there. Look at me. Look at my family. Look at my accomplishments. And it's exciting to share nice things about your family. I love especially those of you who share pictures of your little children and grandchildren. Those I call day brighteners. When I see the little faces and they're having a good time, those are fun. I love the pictures of the kids and the, and the grandkids. I love that. But more often than not, we're promoting ourselves. We're pumping ourselves up. And, and in the last few uh, years, we've coined the phrase virtue signaling. Because we want to show people that we actually are better than we really are. Okay. Yes, I'm all for this. I'm all about that. And we think we've done something. And it's all about promoting ourselves, pumping ourselves up. Look at me. Look what I'm doing. Look what I've done. So much so that we've lost a great deal of that understanding of humility. Now, let me, under, let, let, let me define what humility is so we can understand it. Humility is not thinking lowly of yourselves. And we all have come up to those people. We'd like you to teach this Sunday school class. Oh, I can't teach. I'm not very smart at all. We'd like you to come sing in the praise. Day. Well, I can't sing. I'm no good at all. I'm nothing. I'm just nothing. I'm not like Mike or Pastor Mike or Aaron. I can't. And, we, and we think, oh, I'm just nobody. I'm nothing. I can't do anything. That's not humility. Humility is not thinking low of yourself. As many Bible teachers tell us, humility is truly not thinking of yourself at all. Not thinking of yourself at all. And I think this week in Bible school, we not only need to teach the children, but we can watch them. And learn from them. That's certainly what Jesus wanted to do. And, and in his time, even among his disciples, the men that followed him everywhere, the men that gave up their livelihoods to be with him, 
They needed to learn humility. There was a need for humility. Let's look at this in, in, in Matthew chapter 18. As we pick it up in verse 1, it says, At the time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now let's stop there. Look at this discussion and, and other gospels that record this a little bit more in detail. The disciples, before they actually went to Jesus, they were having this discussion of which one of them was going to be the boss. Which one of them was going to be the greatest? Well, I ought to be the leader because da, 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 da. I ought to be the leader because this, this, and that. And we all want to have position. We all jockey for place. And then we start bringing these excuses. Well, I've been at this church for a long time. My daddy's daddy's daddy was the first deacon at West Concord. Or we get excited about, well, I should be this or I should do that. And we get all promoting of ourselves. And we want to be the first in the kingdom. We want to be the biggest dog in the fight. And Jesus had had enough. And so instead of just coming out and rebuking them for it, Jesus, being God flesh, decided to illustrate humility. So he's basically, you know, he says, listen, wait a minute. This discussion isn't right. Why? Because of the direction it was taking them in. Because often when we jockey for position, often when we fight for place, what are we focused on? Focused on ourselves. This was going in a bad direction. As a matter of fact, when you look at the religious landscape of this nation and our world, we've actually kind of moved in that direction. Because many churches today, we have our celebrity pastors, don't we? We have our favorite preachers, our celebrity pastors. Buy their book, watch their video, go to their seminar. In many churches, there's a hierarchy of clergy and lay people. We have robes and we have gowns and we have, we have all sorts of sparkly things and we, we've set up places and we've set up priests and we've set up potentates. We've gone in a direction that we should never have gone in because here's the thing that we need to learn in our lesson of humility. This is not our church. This is not my church. Even though we celebrated my 30th anniversary and I thank you for all the kind words and gifts, this is not my church. And it's not your church. Humility means we don't think of ourselves at all. Because when we start to do that, we start to fight for position. And the problem is we fight. We struggle. We fuss. We fume. Not only in church either. But also in our daily life at work, we're fighting for place. In our families, we struggle. Families always have a pecking order, depending on who gets the attention of the parents, depending on who gets better grades. Have you ever heard, I wish you were like your brother? I wish you were like your sister? Did we hear that? And everybody's trying to jockey, but you know, that's the, a that's the direction we don't need to go into. And that's what a lack of humility does. It causes us to take, to, to, to take places that we don't deserve. It causes us to move in directions that focus on us and not on God. That's why churches fight. That's why churches fuss. That's why churches split. That's why families struggle. That's why businesses struggle. That's why community groups struggle. Because everybody wants to be the big dog. Everybody wants to be the head kahuna. Everybody wants to be the boss. The one on the stage. I can tell you from personal experience, leadership is not all it's cracked up to be. There are times I'd be very happy to let many of you lead in my place. Because here's the thing, when you're out in the head of the pack, the dogs are biting at your heels, okay? It's oftentimes not what everybody wants it to be. I, I, I don't understand why any person in their right mind would run a run to be president of the United States, amen? Amen. That's not a job I want to have. That's, I'd rather face a battery of angry demons than run for the presidency of the United States. Because at the end of the day, yep, you might be elevated, but there's always somebody wanting to take you down. And sometimes, unfortunately, it's that way in church. So Jesus said, listen, there's a need for humility. He noticed that. And so what did he do? Well, notice what he did. He, he decided to show them a pattern for humility. And interestingly enough, 
He didn't say this time, look at me. He used an object lesson. He used an illustration. Notice it says in verse 2, Then Jesus called a little child to him. Now, he, he called a child to him. Now, back in New Testament times, children weren't thought of very highly. Children, if they were thought of at all, would be considered either heirs or farmhands. Okay? Back then, parents had kids so they can help with the chores. They had kids so they can work in the fields. That's why my dad said he had me. I had you, son, because I need help in the yard. And I'll be honest with you, I'm getting ready to lose my lawnmower soon when he graduates and moves out of the house. But oftentimes in biblical days, children were not looked at at all. And literally, they were pressing to be seen and not heard. And Jesus and God throughout the Old Testament and Jesus constantly tried to remind these people how valuable these children were. The book of Psalms tells us that children are a treasure from the Lord. People sometimes say, Pastor, why do we need to spend money on children's ministry? You know why? Because those children need to know Christ as soon as possible. And they don't have jobs to pay for their own ministry. And they are our treasure. Because one day those children are going to grow up, Lord willing, and lead this church. How do you know that, Pastor? We got one of them who is our associate pastor sitting right there. We have another one who leads our finance team and is a wonderful deacon. I can sit out here and point out probably two or three more of the kids that I remember when they were very little. I remember Aaron when he was a kid. Andrew was the more outspoken Thomas child. And Amy, she was tough, but Aaron was quiet. And Aaron was constantly looking around. And I remember Aaron made me nervous. Because I never knew what was going on in Aaron. Yeah, I'm picking on you this morning, brother. Okay. He grew up to be a fine gentleman and leads our church with distinction and dignity. But he was a little sneaky guy back when he was a kid. But that just shows you that these kids that are going to be sitting in your Bible school classes this week, that sit in the congregation, that sit in the Sunday school classes, you don't know that one of those might grow up to pastor the church to lead the children's ministry, to be the deacon chairman. You don't know that they might grow up and be sitting at your bed praying with you when you're ready to breathe the last breath. Children are our treasure. And so Jesus called one of the children to him as a pattern for humility. Notice it says, he called a, a child to him, set him in the midst of them. And I'll tell you, they weren't happy about that. Other gospels tell us they were not, they, they just, what is this about? Get this child out of here. What are you doing? And it says this, and he said to them, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted, that word converted means turned around. In their discussion of who's going to be the first, the best, the toughest, and the highest in the kingdom, he said, "Uh uh-uh, you need to back up and turn around. You need to back up and rethink that. And literally, that's what that word in the Greek for conversion means. It literally means to stop, back up, and turn around. You need to change that discussion and that direction you're going in. You need to change your thoughts and feelings. He said, unless you are converted and notice this and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a pretty heavy phrase. That phrase is pregnant with theology and destiny. He basically told them you need to turn away from being childish and turn to being childlike. Now we all understand what childishness is. Because we use that as a, as a pejorative when somebody's giving us trouble. Well, you're just being childish. When we go, want to go to one restaurant and our spouse or somebody with us says, oh, I don't want to go to that one. I don't like that restaurant. Why? Well, they serve mushrooms and I don't like mushrooms. You're just being childish. You ever heard yourself in that conversation? I want to go out and buy a duck blind. Well, dear, you're just being childish. We need to save that money. You're just being childish. And you know why sometimes we say that to people? Because they're being childish. Because let's face it, even though he's using a child as an illustration, children aren't perfect. They want what they want, don't, don't they? 
And what happens if a child doesn't get what she or he wants sometimes? Temper tantrum, that's right. Y'all ever experienced one of those? I'll never forget, we had Lydia in the mall once, Lydia and Andy. And Lydia was about two or three years old, I can't remember. We were up at uh, Concord Mills and we were walking through and Lydia wanted to go into a certain store, but we were late, we had to get somewhere. And we had to tell her no. And so Liddy decided, I'm going to throw a fit. So she fell down on the floor, kicking and screaming and beating on the floor in the middle of the mall. So you know what I did? Being the child psychologist and parenting expert that I am, I took Susan by the hand, took Andy by the other hand. I stepped over her and kept walking down the mall. Now, I kept an eye on her, but she was just, ah, she was going nuts until she found out that it didn't work. So she calmed down. She sat there for a second, cross-legged, and then got up and joined us, and we didn't hear another word about it. Although while we were making our way after all that, two dear, saintly, seasoned adults came up to me and said, You're a horrible father! <laughs> I guess temper tantrums don't know age, do they? So children can get childish. But they're children. They haven't learned but Jesus is saying, don't be childish, be childlike. In other words, don't worry about your position. Don't worry about who and what you are and, and what you have. He said, you need to change. You need to turn and become like a child. And notice the next line, or you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoa. That's pretty powerful. That's deep stuff. Unless you and I be the kingdom of heaven. What does childlike mean? Well, one major issue of a child's life is a child has to exercise faith every day. The child has to exercise faith that mom and dad and the family will take care of them. The child has to believe that the parents, grandparents, whoever caring for them will provide enough for them to eat. The child has to make sure that the because the child can't go out and get a job. If the child has to get somewhere, somebody, an adult in their life, has to take them there. If a child is going to be educated and be taught, an adult has to teach them. In other words, a child has to trust the loving adults in their lives for everything. For everything. There is no greater faith on earth than the faith of a child. Because the child has no choice. And it's that way with Christianity, too. That's that way with entering in the kingdom of God. We don't march up to the pearly gate one day after death and knock on it and say, God, let me in here. You should see what a great guy or a great young lady I've been. Why, I preached, I sang in the choir, I was a deacon, I taught Sunday school, I taught Christian school, I was a missionary, I, and we start. Doesn't work that way. Childlike faith basically says, I bring nothing, I have nothing, and I am no one. And I'm trusting in only Jesus. That's faith. It's that kind of faith that saves us. It's not faith in who we are, faith in what we have. It's faith in who he is and what he's done. And that involves humility. Humility. Because in order to have true, genuine faith, you have to humble yourself. When we stand before that door, we have to say, God, I, I'm empty. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve heaven. All I can do is believe that Jesus loved me and died for me and he will carry me in. That's the faith, the humble faith of a child. So he's using the children or a child as a pattern for humility. We can learn from the children tonight. We can learn from the children this week, and we should be watching and learning how children respond and react to things. Oh, again, they're not perfect, and they throw fits, and that's where we have to come in and teach them properly. But more often than not, it's so wonderful to be around kids because they trust you implicitly. Until you give them a reason not to. The difference between you and God is God never gives us a reason not to. But children trust us. 
You've all gone to your child's room at night and they're frightened, they're afraid, they're, they're thinking there's a monster under their bed or in their closet. And you come and hold them in your arms and you say, there is no monster, it's okay. The child can then relax and go to sleep. That child trusts that adult. So he said, you need to turn from being childish. I want my way. I want to be first. No, I want to be the boss. I want to be first. No. Childlike faith says, I just want to play. I just want to be there. And unless we exercise that childlike faith, we won't enter the kingdom of heaven trusting in Jesus. See, there are pattern for humility. That's why Jesus used the child. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you be converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He goes on as we finish in this last passage, he gives us the result of humility. Because here's the thing, people say, well, if I humble myself, if I, if I don't stand up for myself, push for myself, promote myself, then who's going to do it? I'll miss that promotion. I won't be able to have that place. I won't get what I want. I'll be passed over. I'll be looked over. I'll be walked over. And that's not the results at all. Oh, you may not get a position. You may not get a, a new raise. You may, yeah, you may miss out on a few things, but that's all right. That's all right. Sometimes we have to tell our kids, there'll be another day. There'll be another party. There'll be another toy. There'll be another time. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. Look what Jesus says the results of humility are. He says in verse 4, Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest of the kingdom of heaven. One of the results of humbling ourselves is that the humble will be raised. Jesus said elsewhere, they that are first shall be last, and they that are last shall be first. And that is true for the kingdom of God. Our, our lot in life is not to promote ourselves, it's to promote Christ. And to leave whatever position or lack thereof we hold in the kingdom up to him. Because I guarantee whatever he gives us will be good and satisfying. We often try to understand the kingdom of heaven by the artifacts and characteristics of the kingdom of humanity and the earth. And it's nothing alike. The kingdom of heaven isn't going to be anything like our existence here. For instance, when you get into heaven, you're not going to care about what position you hold, who is before you, who is after you. You're not going to care and get your feelings hurt. Why? Because you're not going to be focused on yourself. You're going to be focused on the king. You're not going to, be, you're not going to care if somebody gets something that you didn't get. You're not going to care if somebody uh, doesn't speak. You're not going to care about the silly things we care about today. Because just like before the fall, your focus is going to be on Christ. And all you and I are going to care about in heaven is glorifying him. Whether you're the head kahuna or whether you guy that's the lady or guy that sweeps up after everybody in heaven, it's going to be all right. Because in heaven, it's not going to matter. So he says, you and I need to have faith like this little child. He says elsewhere in Scripture, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. He will lift you up. I think many of our churches today, many of our families today, we struggle, we strive, we fuss because we are so interested in having our place, our position, getting out our opinion, having our argument won. We lose friendships, we cause problems. When instead, when we gather to worship God, it becomes all about Him and none about me. People say, I go to XYZ church because of what I get from it. That's not what you're supposed to go for. 
I didn't like the, pa- the, 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 I didn't like the, the, the service this morning, Pastor. I didn't care for it. Francis Chan, the Bible teacher and pastor, said, somebody came up to him one day and said, I really didn't like the service and the music this morning. Francis Chan said, that's all right, it wasn't about you. It wasn't about you. It's not about me, it's about him. Like little children who oftentimes enjoy the very simplest of things. They enjoy just watching animals. They enjoy just the simplest parts of of life. More often than not, it's the adults that complicate it. The humble will be raised. You say, if I humble myself, who's going to raise? Who's going to worry about me? Who's going to raise me? God will. You have to trust him. That's where the faith comes in. But he goes on to say this. Not only will the humble be the, 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 the... He says, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest of the kingdom of heaven. But then in verse 5, he says, whoever receives one little child like this in my name, receives me. And will be received. In other words, when we love these children, we love the humble. When we serve the humble. You know, I think of ministries like the Hellfighters, who serve people that we'd rather ignore the homeless, the struggling, the hurting. They go out of their way to make them comfortable, to take care of them, to look after them, and to value them. When you and I receive somebody that the world casts off, it's like receiving Jesus. How? Because listen, the Bible says in John, He came into His own and His own what? Received Him not. In Isaiah 53, it says Jesus was despised and rejected. When you receive somebody who's humble like a little child, it's like receiving Jesus. And in turn, you're received as well. See, this is why this week's Vacation Bible School and every Sunday here in children's ministry, student ministry, and ministry among each other, ministry out there, These are not just things we do. These are amazing moments for eternal glory. These are events. God bless people who work with little children. You are my heroes. People who work with senior adults who are struggling, you are my heroes. People who work with students who are struggling with life, you are my heroes. Who work with homeless Or maybe just come alongside a friend, a spouse, or a family member who's just not getting it and making it in life. Jesus goes on to say, and give a little caveat here. He gives a little warning. The humble will be raised. The humble will be received. But he gives this little stamp at the end. Sort of a negative and a positive, and we have to kind of, we can't cover the whole passage, but he says in verse 6, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, did you hear that? Let me read that again. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. Now you look at our world today, you look at our culture today, you look at the media and the push to, to indoctrinate children into perversion and to sin. You look at the garbage messages that are being published by Hollywood and and all of these things on television and movies and, 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 and through different places and they're trying to draw the children away from Christ. And unfortunately, because the church sits on its hands and does nothing, we are complicit in that. But whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, notice what Jesus said, it would be better for him. If a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. You know, Jesus was love. He was kind. He was gracious. But Jesus took sin seriously and he took children seriously. And I know this won't set with some people and you'll be all right. You'll get over it. But we live in a world that is trying to drag our children to hell with them. 
And the only bulwark is the Christian parent, the Christian grandparent, the Christian friend, the Christian teacher, the Christian Sunday school worker, the men and women of God tasked with ministry in the church. It depends upon you and me, y'all. It doesn't depend on the Republicans or the Democrats. It doesn't depend upon this group or that group. What we're doing this week in Vacation Bible School is God's work. All this stuff is just the magnet that brings them in. Finally, Jesus in verse 10 closes with this. He said, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you in heaven, I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father is in, who is in heaven. The Bible tells us that little children have angels that look after them, that stand by them. Angels that we can't see, feel, hear. But little children have angels around them that see God's face and watch you and I as we interact with them. He says, they always see the face of my Father who is in heaven, for the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. This isn't just a yearly activity at West Concord. This is a ministry. This is eternal stuff we're doing. As we focus on the children and on the students, we need to teach them truth and righteousness. And not only from our mouths, but we need to model it, but also we need to learn from them. So when we come off this week, we are better for it. We have learned humility, and we have learned to put Christ first. So how to live, how do we have faith like a child? Let's finish this up. Number one, ask God to search your heart. Ask God to search your heart. Little children always want to make sure they're pleasing their parents and grandparents and families. They say, look at me. Did you see me? Were you watching me? They want to gain approval from you. And that's what we need to seek from God. But for God to do that, he needs to look at us and search our hearts. We need to seek wonder. I remember when my children were little, just showing them simple things. Just thrilled them. I remember when they began to get old enough to understand Christmas and all the lights and all the beauty of it. I'd love taking my kids to these new things and just, you know, I don't like Disney World because it has too many people there. But when I had little children taking them, I got to see it all fresh and the wonder and joy in their eyes. It's a shame they're going in the direction they're going in, but we're losing the wonder. I remember the first time my kids saw the Gulf of Mexico, they were just like, whoa. I'd seen it a hundred times growing up in Central Florida, but when they saw it, it was like seeing it new. We need to seek wonder. We spend too many hours trying to figure it out and try to master it and get a hold of it. And sometimes we need to sit and look at the life and the creation of God and just be awestruck. We need to express love. Man, you have a bad day, you're struggling, and you come home, and the first thing you get is a hug from that little child. Oh, there's nothing like it. We need to express love. And like a child rests in your care, we need to rest in God's care. When God says there are no monsters there that can hurt you, we need to believe him and trust him. So as we finish this morning to have faith, to be humble, we must think, wander, and believe like a child. Childlike faith is an innocent, humble faith that believes and trusts. So this week, as you're going through Bible school, as you're teaching, watching, observing, look at those children. Look how excited they are for making a craft or getting a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. How much fun they have going out in the grass and playing kickball how they're awestruck by some of the things they hear about God. We need to learn from the children. Standing together as we close in prayer, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. This is going to be an amazing week. Amazing because we get the privilege, the privilege 
of serving and teaching children and students the Word of God. There is no greater privilege on the planet than to do that. But we also get the privilege of watching and learning from those little dear kids. First of all, we need to learn the faith that they have, just like their faith in the adults in their life. We need to trust God with everything. It, it starts with salvation. It's try to, trying to burst open the doors of the gates of heaven. We need to go to God like a child and say, I have nothing. I need your everything and place our faith and confidence in Christ as our Savior. And then once we do that, we need to walk. I remember when Andy turned too old to hold my hand in public. He said, Dad, I'm getting too old. I'm not going to hold your hand anymore. I tell you what, that broke my heart. We need to take God's hand as we go through life. Just like a child holds on to his parent or her parent when they're walking through a strange place. We need to grab God's hand and hold it and not let go. Instead of trying to jockey for position, popularity, we need to go to the Lord and say, without you, I am nothing. We need to surrender our lives now to God as believers and say, God, you're, you're the heavenly father. I am your child. Lord, I deserve nothing. And I only want what you want that is best for me. So this morning as we gather and as we pray before we finish, yes, pray for Bible school. Pray that God would bless those who are working. Pray for safety. But most importantly, pray that the eternal, amazing, powerful word of God will go out to the hearts of these children and these students who come. But also pray that God will open my eyes and your eyes to the sweet humility of childlike faith so that we might see grace, wonder, beauty, and the face of God. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. We thank you for the privilege of gathering here to worship you. Father, we thank you for the even greater privilege of working with those who need to hear the truth. Thank you for those who work with our children and our students Thank you for those that work with our senior adults and our adults as we struggle and, and, and forage through life. Father, may our hearts be your hearts. Father, I pray that everyone in the sound of my voice, whether personally or online, can trust Christ as their Savior and, and go to him in childlike faith, falling and resting upon him, knowing that you will catch them and save them. And Father, I pray for these who are gathered here in this building as we prepare for this week's chaos, busyness, fun. I pray that you would do miraculous things this week. And I pray that we would come to you with our hands open and our hearts open and fall into your arms. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, Amen, amen and amen. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.